we need to we need to show that corruption is a punishable offence, that there are repercussions for it, um, not against journalists but against the people who are guilty of the crimes, um, and in that way begin changing the culture too, because I have to say that that it's also a cultural problem. It's my pleasure to welcome today's panelists the audience in the room, and of course our viewers online, to our press conference, Corruption and Democracy. Today we'll be discussing uh, really the key findings of Transparency International Corruption Perception Index and getting some feedback and context in specific countries. Today I'm joined by Delia Ferreira Rubio, Chair of Transparency International, Dr. Mug Witsi, Masisi, President of the Republic of Botswana, and Matthew Caruana Galizia, Director of Daphne Caruana Galizia Foundation. Welcome. Thank you. First, let's start with the report. It was just launched. Um, Delia, could you please share with us the key findings and really the surprises um, in that ranking? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the Corruption Perception Index is an instrument that we have been running for more than 20 years from Transparency International, and we have launched it today. It's a, um, an index on perceptions of academic experts and business sector on the corruption in the public sector of countries. We are not measuring here money laundering, illicit financial flow, asset uh, recovery, or things like that. Just public sector corruption. We um, use 13 sources, and we have measured 190 countries this year uh, on a scale that goes from 100, which means perceived as very clean, to zero, perceived as very uh, or highly corrupt. And um, uh, I will tell you the, the best performing countries and also the, those <laughs> at the bottom, but what is important is that we are not just making numbers of this. We are correlating these results with uh, certain aspects of governance, uh, of um, um, rule of law, and uh, other characteristics of our democracies. And there is a clear correlation, repeated year after year, between corrupt countries and weakened political institutions. Uh, or a weak rule of law, lack of trust in institutions, um, the undermining of democracy. This correlation is clear. Corruption means this. We are not talking about casual um, things. We are talking about things that correlate. And this year we incorporated another factor, which is the influence of big money in politics and uh, the correlation between uh, campaign financing, regulation and enforcement, and corruption or transparency. And there is a clear correlation between countries where corruption is high and uh, the regulation is not existent or is weak in terms of campaign finance or money and politics, or you have good rules but very bad inform enforcement of that rules. This correlation is clear. The best performing countries and the average, the global average this year in this scale 100 to 0 is 43, so there is no great improvement globally. And uh, the best performing countries are Denmark and New Zealand, Finland, Singapore, Sweden, Switzerland, and those at the bottom part of the index are Venezuela in Latin America, Yemen, Syria, South Sudan, and Somalia. And of course, there are uh, in each region well-performing countries, and I really have to thank the presence of President Masisi because uh, Botswana is the yellow country. If you see our map, we have yellow for the countries that are clean or perceived as clean and transparent, and the red, 
means corruption. And in the sub-Saharan region, the only yellow spot is Botswana. So congratulations for all your efforts. Um, you can find all the material in transparency.org, and you can find um, detailed analysis region by region, the countries that have um, performed better in each, in each region. And one other thing that we incorporated this year is the relation or the responsibility that countries that are performing well in terms of the index and their responsibility in global corruption, because the money that is stolen in the countries perceived as, as corrupt ends in banks and uh, fortunes and luxury uh, things in uh, the countries that are seen as transparent. So corruption is a global problem and has, be, uh, has to be tackled by the global community. As the Manifesto 2020 says this year, we need uh, collective action and a stakeholders approach if we are going to stop corruption. I will Thank leave you. it there. <laughs> President Masisi, uh, Delia reflected on how Botswana is this shining yellow dot on the map. Um, could you share with us your views on Sub-Saharan Africa's performance, and more specifically on the fact that Botswana ranked second in the region and 34 globally? What is Botswana doing right? Well, thank you very much. Um, I guess it's a matter of interpreting an objective result rather than an act of kindness on their part to suggest that we're, we're doing well. So I, I will take that back with me home and really thank the institutions and all the citizens of Botswana for doing this. But we remain dissatisfied. Mm. Our fight against corruption is a race to a finish line that never ends. So it does not mean there is no corruption in Botswana. There is corruption. But you've got to be dynamic in responding by plugging the holes to that corruption. Botswana exists not in isolation. We are part of Southern Africa. We are part of Africa. We are part of the global community. And the very fact that we could attempt as much as we have to extricate ourselves of negative influences speaks a lot to our governance. We are a democratic country, and democracy is incomplete without transparency, without accountability. And so we, we do get held accountable for what we do. But we also, in government, do play a part, as we have done recently, when, in the perception of many, corruption seemed to be growing, or those who were perceived to be corrupt seem to be getting away scot-free. And so we closed a big hole, a gap. We passed a legislation law which requires all political leaders, right from my level, those in the National Assembly and Council, all senior public officers, and the, those in the judiciary to declare publicly their assets mm -hmm. and their liabilities. We put in place, uh, it's just, these are very recent developments. We put in place a directorate of integrity uh, managed in the office of the president for the simple reason that it's supposed to bear its influence on other institutions of the state. And uh, the judiciary is responding likewise by, um, they have a dedicated judge for anti-corruption uh, and we hope they will increase the number of judges that are dedicated to that. We've also passed a number of other pieces of legislation, you know, such as uh, protection of whistleblowers and amended the uh, corruption um, uh, piece of and the corruption and uh, economic crimes act mm -hmm. um, to tighten the loose ends because we keep learning from what you do. But you see, corruption is, is multifaceted. Uh, they are the motivators of corruption and they are the actors, and then they are the beneficiaries. You always would have in a third world developing country like mine, 
actors who often act in cahoots with players who ply their trade and residence in countries that are not in Africa and who reside or are citizens of countries that are perceived to have very low level of corruption. And so I think it is time, particularly for Transparency International, to take the bull by the horns and let's start following, tracking, reporting on those who benefit from corruption. You know, international piracy, which this amounts to, is a system whereby you tolerate the exhortation, exhortation of funds, resources from a state to another state, and then you legitimize it because you've discovered that they're not democratic or not respecting human rights and you seize the assets of such. This behavior needs to stop because it continues to marginalize developing countries. And finally, I would have expected these chairs to be packed with people who are all in the value chain of corruption. And they're missing. Because anti-corruption is a means, though not complete or enough sufficient, to realization of the SDGs. You cannot, you never will, realize your SDGs or your development challenges. However developed or sophisticated you are, when corruption continues to persist at the levels that it does. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, you know, is to do with poverty, iniquity, uh, no clean water, pollution, environmental mismanagement, etc. So because we subscribe to these good values, we do it because it's the right thing to do for development. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on to the, uh, the question, I'd like to invite Matthew to talk about the fact that Malta has significantly declined in the CPI. It's dropped six points since 2015. Can you explain to us what has contributed to this decline and um, classification of Malta as a country to watch? Okay, perhaps for, for people who aren't aware um, of why I'm here exactly. My mother was uh, an investigative journalist investigating corruption in Malta, who was murdered in 2017. And that murder did not happen in isolation. It wasn't an isolated attack. It happened specifically because Malta's government chose to go in the exact opposite direction of, for example, Botswana's government and practically adopt corruption rather than anti-corruption as a, as a policy. And when, when a government chooses to do this because it is a choice, then that automatically puts journalists who investigate corruption in great danger and leads to murders, which is why my mother was murdered. That started, I suppose, with, with the election to government of our former prime minister. Malta already had weak institutions to begin with, but the, the government's program of privatization, selling passports, um, granting licenses to banks from Iran, um, just fomented more corruption. And as journalists like my mother began to to publish evidence of this corruption, instead of fighting, uh, fighting that corruption, fighting those crimes, the government doubled down and began to take measures to d decapitate the authorities and institutions of the state that are supposed to be fighting that corruption. So things just got worse and worse once the government did that in order to protect um, people in government in order to protect co corrupt officials, it opened up the door to more transnational organized crime. And eventually things went into a spiral of decline, which is why Malta's ranking has continued to fall and why it continues to be a country to watch. Now, our way out of this is, is very clear. 
I mean, journalists can, can continue publishing evidence of corruption, but unless, um, unless our authorities are reformed or start acting in the way they should, then we're going to continue being in danger. So yes, our institutions need to be reformed. We need Malta to implement the, the recommendations of the Council of Europe. But we need our authorities to begin acting immediately. We need to, we need to show that corruption is a punishable offence, that there are repercussions for it, um, not against journalists, but against the people who are guilty of the crimes. Um, and in that way, begin changing the culture too. Because I have to say that, that it's also a cultural problem. Thank you. And we've seen some of that um, exemplified by Isabel Dos Santos being charged today. Yes, I mean, that's a really good example because, uh, of course, she's an extremely corrupt figure, um, took advantage of weak systems of governance within her country, took advantage of nepotism, but she was enabled by accountants and lawyers in Malta and elsewhere. Um, Malta's government turned a blind eye to the money laundering that was uh, that was allow money laundering occurring in Malta that was allowing her to siphon all of this money that belonged to the public of Angola. Um, and in that way, things just got worse and worse for the people of Angola. But things also get worse in Malta because what does what do vested interests have to do in order to allow this money laundering to happen, the transnational money laundering? They have to weaken the institutions in my own country, in Malta. They have to weaken institutions in Europe. So, as you said, we really need to work together to make sure that we're, we're fighting what is actually um, transnational organized crime and corruption together. Um, otherwise, if there are weak countries like Malta that can continue to enable the corruption of Isabel dos Santos or the corruption of Maltese officials, then, I mean, things are just going to continue to get worse. Mm -hmm. So I, I if you want to add. To add to what uh, I uh, have just been said about Malta. In this Dos Santos scandal, the role of gatekeepers has been of key importance. Mm. Gatekeepers should <laughs> do their work. Gatekeepers are bankers, accountants, uh, lawyers, so uh, assurance companies, investment companies. So we need this uh, fight against corruption to be done as a stakeholder task including governments, including uh, citizens. Of course, investigative journalists are key in the fight against corruption. And we need the business sector. We were talking yesterday at the Pachi meeting. We need the business sector to participate actively in the fight against corruption, not only because of values, integrity, or ethics, but because of clear, effective influence of corruption in competitiveness, in, in the capacity to do business and to uh, obtain profits. So if they don't want to participate out of values, they can participate out of very concrete things. And we need the engagement of uh, civil society and citizens. If societies tolerate corruption, they will keep sending the wrong message to the corrupt guys. You can go on because we keep on voting you, for instance, or we keep on um, buying your products because it doesn't matter. Well, yes, corruption matters in terms of SDGs, in terms of human rights, in terms of democracy. So we have to work together. It's the only way. In fact, the, the position of my family is that um, while justice for my mother after her murder is important, it's the number one priority for us, we're never going to be able to bring her back. So the best that we can do to make sure that she didn't die in vain 
is to make sure that a country like Malta doesn't end up in the situation ever again. Because we weren't so corrupt to begin with. Things were allowed to get worse over time. And how can we do this? Civil society needs to be engaged. But really, the only uh, solid way to do it is to have effective supranational mechanisms that fight money laundering and cross-border crime and corruption. Because uh, once I mean, Malta joined the European Union in 2004, once that happened, we were flooded with new money without the ability to fight the, the crime that comes with it. So within zones of free trade where money fro flows freely, like the European Union or other regional free trade groups that are forming, you need to have some level of compromise where states agree to give up some of their sovereignty um, with, with respect to uh, the rule of law, the fight against money laundering and corruption. It's really the only way. So I'm going to open up the floor to see if there are any questions in the room. The gentleman in the back, please state your name and your media outlet. Uh, my name is Mokit. I come from Botswana. Uh, my question goes straight to uh, Transparency International. Uh, I would like to know uh, what uh, your organization, uh, Rubio, is doing uh, to ensure that ef good efforts by countries such as Botswana uh, are sustained in terms of uh, building uh, capacities. Uh, because it's uh, important to have such uh, good support systems or we will be uh, fighting a, a losing battle. Thank you. Is there, to go for we're going to take a couple of questions. Are there any other questions? The gentleman in the front. Um, I am uh, Alan Gimbal from, from Daily Newspaper, La Croix French Daily Paper. And I have a question to Mr. Caruana Galizia. I'm, I'm sorry to be so bad informed about Malta, but um, don't you consider that there was some effort done in Malta since uh, the murder of your mother? There, there was not so any reaction from the, the government or any reform to, to fight against corruption? And also, I have a question to Ms. Uh, Ferreira Rubio about uh, France. Uh, I saw that in your uh, index, France um, um, withdrew from, from four points since the last uh, index. And it's difficult for me to understand why there was this, um, uh, this uh, downsize of, the, of France. So uh, if you can give me an explanation, please. Thank you very much. And we're going to take one more question, if there's any other questions on the floor. Yes. Hi, I'm, my name is Tim Coe, and I work for a, um, a, a publication called Daily Maverick in South Africa. Um, I just wanted to ask Ms. Rubio uh, to what extent extradition is, um, to what extent you think extradition, uh, changing extradition laws would be helpful here. Um, we, um, um, in South Africa, we're very frustrated with, you know, people see that the things are changing and then, you know, they, um, move to a country, they move their money and they move to a country where there's no extradition agreement and uh, then you're really stuck. You know, you, the, um, uh, it's important for civil society that, to see that uh, people who are corrupt do get eventually prosecuted and if they're not living in the, uh, your country anymore, it's, uh, it's difficult to achieve that. And I know a couple of people joined us late. Is there any other questions? Oh. Lots of questions. Hi, I'm Kamaru from Malaysia. Nice to meet you again, Matthew. Congratulations, President Masisi and uh, Delia. But um, coming from a country that's you know, famously known as for the one MDB episode, my question is, there's a worry about the pervasiveness of corruption at the lower level from a traffic police, to, you know, motorist giving. But when it happens at the very top tier of the nation, it has to do with supranational linkages and network. Mm -hmm. How would the TI report work against big companies, big brand names like Goldman Sachs, who has not really owned up to what has happened to 1MDB, and in fact, is in negotiation 
for reparation damages. Is this is the kind of reaction that we're going to get from such a big, big uh, incident of corruption? Then what's the point of the TI, uh, CPI? Because it will keep on happening, and it will have the adverse effect of the younger population of in my country, for example, seeing things like that. You see. The big fish will always get away because this is about big money. Mm -hmm. So if there's a movement here, we don't know what's going on behind the scene. Maybe you're talking to Professor Klaus Schwab. If there's so much emphasis on ESG, where is the emphasis of the stakeholder capitalism movement of metrics to also include the CPI into any big financial investment or development project around the world? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Question. So. Who would like to tackle this very good bundle of questions? Do you want to go, Matthew? Okay, I'll, I'll start with the question from, from Lacroix. So while the, the new government has started off on a, on a very bad footing, um, just for people in the room who, who aren't aware, our prime minister, Malta's prime minister, resigned um, not so long ago. And we have a new government from his same political par party, um, but which has started off on a, on a very bad footing already, because many of the people that, um, that backed up our former prime minister um, over the past four years of, uh, of very aggressive corruption are still within the new government. Um, and it seems that while he is willing to make some concessions, I don't think that his government feels the kind of anger at corruption that it should really be feeling. It doesn't seem to be honest. Uh, it seems to be more of... Um, of a compromise rather than anything else. It doesn't seem to be, um, it doesn't seem to be rooted in any sense of indignation at the corruption of the former government. It seems to be more of a, of a case of, uh, of offering some sort of, uh, some sort of compromise in exchange for, um, in exchange for things calming down in the long term. But uh, that's not really what we need now. What we need is someone or a group of people in government who are willing to go after corruption in a, in a more aggressive way and who feel an honest drive to fight it rather than people who think, oh, let's just um, make this compromise now and in the long term everything will just go away because it isn't going to go away. Unless something really radical is done, then things will be left to fester. And of course, society will never move forward either because the wound will just be left open. Delia? Well, I have lots of questions here, starting with the uh, journalists from Botswana. We work uh, through our chapters in more than 100 countries, uh, helping governments or proposing laws or proposing uh, mechanisms to hold to account those in power and the business sector in the country according to the situation of the respective country. So uh, we have created lots of tools and we keep on investigating and producing um, tools that uh, allows the chapter in each country to tackle the problem or to investigate more seriously. For instance, this year we have been working on money and politics and campaign finance, and we have developed tools that allows citizens to see who is giving money to whom, in what amounts, and what uh, is this money uh, being used to. And 
this uh, kind of information, access to information, facilitates then the detection of potential conflicts of interest or the evaluation of public policies, because if you can see who finance whom, uh, you can explain sometimes what decisions has been taken in terms of public policy. So there are many tools. In terms of France, I would have uh, to check all the sources included. This is an index of indexes, so um, we have to check what the sources corresponding to France, which are on our platform, so you can access yourself. But I compromise to check with the research team what are the descent uh, figures in the sources that explain this uh, statistical change. In some, can, in some cases, the mathematical or arithmetical thing of uh, four points up or down are not statistically rele uh, relevant according to the margin of error. But we have to take care of that. I, compromise, I commit to, to do that and send you the information. Mm. You can do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, in terms of extradition law, of course, this has to do with mu mutual legal assistance, because this is a global problem, as you mentioned. So we cannot afford to have islands of protection or islands of uh, impunity where people can go and bring the money and have a luxurious uh, life without taking care of what they have done and without being sanctioned. So, the, but um, stopping this mechanism of extradition requires to be effective global action in terms of convention or uh, rules that, uh, standards that can be applied um, worldwide, uh, globally. In terms of petty, Petty corruption is the one to one, the police, uh, the, the people that has to pay for a place in the school or a bed in a hospital. It's terrible. It affects directly uh, individual persons and affects human rights. And you have to consider that two thirds of the 180 chapter, um, countries, two thirds are under 50. So that means that billions of people are facing or are living in everyday corrupt environments affecting their quality of life and their possibilities of future. The other type of corruption is grand corruption, which needs a special responses because it is global, because it involves the highest levels, both at the government and, and the companies. And in, in terms of doing something or reflecting the, prog the, the problem uh, of grand corruption, Transparency International has many other indexes and reports. For instance, exporting re uh, corruption is a report that analyzes what's the um, uh, behavior of companies vis-a-vis -vis bribing abroad, although they are, they have their presential resident and tax resident in countries that are scoring well. So we have the exporting corruption report. We have done other uh, reports taking into account how countries in the European Union, for instance, are fulfilling the anti-money laundering directives of the European Union in order to detect whether they are really fulfilling their commitments and the rules approved or not. And we reflect that. That's, uh, these are informations that are available for everyone, investors, companies doing business. And you mentioned investors and, of course, they can use this information to, in a certain way, de determine where to go with the invest uh, investment. And uh, multilaterals, for instance, can use the anti-corruption information to establish conditionalities when they give loans to countries in order to incentivize the right uh, behavior. So there are many things that we are doing, and there are um, different tools that reflect or picture different aspects of corruption. And the other one, which is very important and, and gives the information of 
how people perceive corruption and suffer corruption in their countries is the global barometer of corruption. You can find it in our website. And it is not uh, reflecting the opinion of experts or business people. It reflects the opinion of people in each of the countries where uh, we are working. Thank you. Let me just uh, add to the answer given um, earlier pro to the question by the Botswana journalist on what uh, Transparency National could do or is doing to reward the good efforts that uh, we make in Botswana. We had an, an, an informal discussion um, early on with uh, Madame Rubio about uh, the possibility of the brand Transparency International, the institution Transparency International, in partnership with the Botswana government, hosting a Pan-African conference on anti-corruption to really deal with the scores across Africa, including those of Botswana. Now, it's in our national interest to help other countries come up to standard, particularly in our region, because we trade immensely with countries nearby us, but we also, uh, we've also subscribed to the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's going to be extremely hard for uh, business people to trade with some countries, I'm not mentioning any names, because of uh, the, the, the indexes that we, the indices that we see. So we, we would be uh, advancing this. Mm -hmm. um, our head of public services here, he'll uh, advance it and we'll find a mutually convenient time uh, so that we do this, because our objective is to advance uh, the annihilation mm -hmm. of corruption and opportunities for corruption. And uh, you talked about extradition, or somebody, I think, talked yeah. about uh, changes in extradition law. Yes, we, we also experience it as a state. Uh, we need to have uh, extradition facilitated uh, in manners similar to exporting coffee or beef or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's got to be a demand for it and enablement of it across states, particularly for corruption-related um, uh, issues. And um, I'd like to state that uh, uh, Botswana uh, is yellow. It does not mean that there is no corruption in Botswana. It does not mean that uh, we are necessarily better than last year, because these are relative measures. So we'd like to hope mm -hmm. that one day we'll have an opportunity to actually start getting criteria and reference measures so that we measure our performance against our own standards and ourselves. So we genuinely improve and look at the rate of improvement. So, um, but we are sure that we are, we're really committed, at least politically, we're committed to um, doing all we can to um, make it extremely hard, if not impossible, uh, for corruption to take place. Um, in Botswana. In the era of digitization, uh, new challenges emerge every day. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thanks. I wanted to mention before we close out the forum's work on Partnering Against Corruption Initiative, which is called PACHI, uh, which is information that you can find also on our website. I encourage you to go to transparency.org to look at um, the report and look deeper on the findings. Um, it sounds like there's we know there's an urgent call for action and collaboration. Um, corruption is definitely in one country, impacts all countries everywhere. And I thank my panelists for sharing their experience uh, and their knowledge and expertise. And I thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thanks, Thank you very much.